France had long been convinced that they would scrape together the money – 10, 25, 30 dollars each. Those who buy a share would become shareholders in the company. If successful, their capital would multiply. In the meantime, they were all ready to build airplanes on enthusiasm. He was able to realize the dream of Leonardo da Vinci, the great artist and engineer of the Renaissance. But it took the little boy from Kiev decades. It started from his mother's fairy tales about aircraft to mass production. Scientist and inventor, creator of the world's first four-engine Russian Vitez plane, a heavy four-engine bomber, and the Ilya Muromets passenger plane, a transatlantic hydroplane, a serial single-rotor helicopter, the outstanding Ukrainian Ihor Sikorsky. Leonardo racked his brains for years to sketch the design of the future. He carefully studied the parts and sketched, and finally he collected all the parts into a single one, a ready-made, fully-fledged illustration. It seemed that the decision was oh so close. I think that if this mechanism is soundly made out of starched linen and quickly spun, it will find support in the air and soar high into the sky. But it was impossible to create a helicopter that would rise with the help of a vertically rotating propeller. It was only in the 20th century that the idea of a brilliant Italian could be realized by a Ukrainian designer. Ihor's father, Ivan Sikorsky, was a famous Kyiv psychiatrist. When on May 25, 1889, his fifth child, son Iher, was born, Grand Duke Peter, cousin of the Russian Emperor, and his mother, Grand Duchess Alexandra Petrovna, became his godparents. Famous members of society considered it prestigious to intermarry with members of the royal family. In so doing, they became close to the court. My family comes from a village in Kyiv region, where my grandfather and great-grandfather were priests of Ukrainian origin. However, it was part of Russia then, and the Ukrainian people were integrated into Russia as Texas or Louisiana, an integrated part of the United States. The boy was his mother's favorite son. She was an educated woman, and he liked to listen to her stories about the infinity of the universe, the mystery of the stars, and the secrets of the oceans and seas. But most of all, the boy's imagination was stirred by stories about the 15th-century genius Leonardo da Vinci and his iron bird, a flying machine. It was supposed to rise into the air using the force of a powerful rotor without any acceleration. I had a strange dream. It's as if I am a grown man already playing chess with Leonardo da Vinci. We argue, discuss aircraft. I woke up with the feeling that my entire life depends on the results of this game. In 1900, Ihor Sikorsky enrolled in the first Kyiv Gymnasium, the oldest educational institution with remarkable pedagogical traditions. Over the years, the eminent artist Mikola Ge, the historian Mikola Zakrevsky, the writers Konstantin Postovsky and Mikhailo Bulgakov all graduated from it. However, Sikorsky did not like the humanities and sought to learn the exact science. St. Petersburg Marine Cadet Corps. Its origin started from the middle of the 18th century, when the Russian Empress Elizaveta Petrovna decided to open a naval establishment for noble children. Sergei, the elder brother of Iher, studied here. The parents decided to place the youngest one here too. Three years flew by, and the failed midshipman left the city on the Neva with the comment, not for me. He was impeded in the mastery of the naval sciences by reports in newspapers about brave men from overseas. The USA, December 17, 1903. Wilbur and Orville Wright got their Wright flyer plane into the air. The glider was in the air for just 12 seconds. But this presentation is now considered the first ever successful flight of a manned vehicle heavier than air with an engine. Publications about brave transatlantic souls did not give Sikorsky peace.
Paris, fashion city. Here, the young man went to the Duvignon de la Noe Technical School. The shy young man with a thin, elongated face and a well-groomed mustache did not attract the girls. Ihor did not spend his father's money in cafes, but devoted himself completely to the technical school. But six months later, he returned to Ukraine. His mom died. At home, he enrolled at the Kyiv Polytechnic Institute. I take the hat off to the alma mater who trained me to conquer the sky. National Technical University of Ukraine Kyiv Polytechnic Institute is named in honor of its student Ihor Sikorsky. KPI was founded in 1898 on the model of the École Polytechnique in Paris. It became the highest new type of technical school. Here, young people received deep training in mathematics, physics, chemistry, and other disciplines. Initially, the institute had four departments – mechanical, chemical, engineering, and agricultural. The lecturers advocated the creation of a fifth, an aeronautical department. A section with departments for aeroplanes, helicopters, ornithopters and engines was also organized. It became the main research and design center of aviation in the Russian Empire. Ihor Sikorsky became an active participant in the helicopter department. Soon, stunning news from France made Sikorsky plan his future. In Paris, the first vertical lift aircraft in the world took off, managing to get up 1.5 meters in height. The innovation by designers Louis, Jacques Bruguet and Charles Richet had four rotors. This event was the reason for heated discussions in technical circles. Ihor held another family meeting and decided to go to Paris again. There he met aviation pioneer Ferdinand. He said that it was easy to invent a flying machine, it was more difficult to build and it was almost impossible to make it fly. A man of the 20th century can be considered an intellectual super-dinosaur. After six months of construction and several months of failed tests, Sikorsky returned to his native Kyiv. He didn't bring gifts and souvenirs, but two engines, 25 and 15 horsepower engines. Ihor strengthened the rotors invented in Paris on the snowmobile that he had personally designed. He demonstrated it to officers of the general staff. The event was widely covered by the press. The fame of Sikorsky was strong not only in Kyiv, but also in the whole Russian Empire. In spring 1913, his grand airship completed a series of flights in St. Petersburg. Sikorsky wanted to prove the possibility of taking to the air and landing safely. The invention had a living room inside the fuselage with armchairs and a table, as well as a washroom. In fact, the cabin contained everything necessary, like in a modern passenger plane. Later, the ship was called Russian Vidyas or Russian Knight. It was built by Sikorsky at the Russian Baltic Carriage Plant, the main designer of the aviation department of which he was appointed. A few months after the first flight by the Russian Knight, the public were in delight from the Ilya Muromets liner, which was gigantic in those days. The designer decided to set a world record for flight range. Sikorsky and his three followers planned to get from St. Petersburg to Odessa in 24 hours, but only got as far as Kiev. Thanks to the White Knights, the flight began under excellent conditions, but a strong head wind soon blew. The Ilya Murmets plane made its first stop in Orsha and the second due to worsening gas supply at the Kopis station. The overall conditions of the flight were unfavorable. Ilya Murmets spent all its time in the thunderclouds. It had to fly in the pouring rain and headwinds for two hours. We flew without seeing any land at all. We navigated by using a compass. They made a sortie near Kyiv, breaking through a thick clouds to the ground. It turned out that Kyiv was already behind us. I had to turn back to the airfield. A distance of 1,020 versts was covered in 13 hours and 10 minutes. Mormitz later set his first world record in the number of passengers carried on board, 16 people and even the airfield dog. The load was 1,290 kilograms. 
Sikorsky was granted the Order of St. Volodymyr, fourth degree, for merits in military aviation, granting him nobility. Recognition inspired genius towards new feats. After stormy greetings, someone mentioned news from abroad. Archduke Franz Ferdinand had been killed in Sarajevo, however, they were all too absorbed in flying to think about the consequences of this event. Today, humanity is going through a period of crisis of unprecedented depth. Devastating wars and revolutions have shaken the world, but this is only an outward manifestation of global instability, the main reason for which should be sought in internally deep confusion in the spiritual and moral spheres of life. The murder of Archduke Franz Ferdinand was only a pretext for the start of World War I. The Russian Empire took the side of the Entente powers. At this time, Sikorsky was responsible for supplying Ilya Muromets heavy bombers for the army. The years went by. The war had tired out all the participants of the planetary battle. But things were not so good in the young Sikorsky family. The designer got married. His wife was Olha Sienkiewicz. A daughter, Tatiana, was born soon. However, the wife plunged herself into the ideas of Bolshevism. Ihor did not share her views. Divorce could not be avoided. The designer was in his apartment in St. Petersburg. This is where he learned about the October 1970s. Revolution. In a cold January night in 1919, a worker from a Russian Baltic factory knocked on Sikorsky's door. He said that during the day suspicious-looking types in leather jackets would show a keen interest in him. Without wasting time, the designer moved into a bungalow near the airfield. In the morning, he started getting ready the necessary papers for going abroad. A month later, he left for Paris. He never returned home again. Life itself played a game of chess against me. I lose one piece after another. My position becomes dangerous. In emigration, the designer took a couple of hundred British pounds and blind faith in his work. But Europe was already full of Russian refugees. Even the glory of Sikorsky lost its shine, as the aviation industry collapsed after the end of World War I. He didn't want to sit in Paris without work. There was no way back home. Only a country of great opportunities and active people awaited him. In spring 1919, Sikorsky arrived in the USA. Dear friend Leonardo, I no longer felt like a significant figure. Here I was a simple pawn among important queens and elephants. New York, a city of hopes and illusions. Here a poor man can become a rich man and a rich man turn into a poor man. The dollar and good connections rule the fate of a man. I didn't know the language well, and Kiev immigrants helped me to settle at first. There were lots of them in New York, but it was very difficult to get a job in a specialist field. I spent three months at aviation offices. Using very basic English, I tried to explain what great airplanes I could build. Businessmen only kept an indifferent silence. Sikorsky seemed to be a mild and non-conflictual person. But in fact, he had the strong character of a fighter. He refused to accept defeat. On April 20th, 1919, the New York Times wrote, Mr. Sikorsky declares that he is ready to produce airplanes that can fly a distance of 25,000 kilometers without a problem. One of the immigrants recommended her as a mathematics teacher at an evening school for Russian workers on the east side. The maths lessons gradually became the foundations of aviation. The teacher enthusiastically told of his plans of the future, capable of taking 40 or even 50 people into the sky. Airships will fly huge spaces and will be reliable, tough and safe. People will quickly get used to this method of transport and will buy tickets or book a cabin on an airship as easily as they buy a ticket at a train station. These aircraft will be built according to the type of aircraft. Hot air balloons are unlikely to become popular. 
the designer had followers who were ready to build his planes for free. At school, he met Elizabeth Simeon, a pretty colleague and daughter of a former Russian officer. Life was on the up. The designer spent about a year on the first project. He decided to open a company on Long Island called Sikorsky Aero Engineering Corporation. Six people worked in the office. The company's cash desk contained just $800 at the time. However, the company issued shares for $10 each, with faith in victory and profit. Former compatriots bought these securities, who later spoke about Sikorsky. Always neatly dressed, a trim gentleman with a mustache, trimmed with a brush, came to work before dark, left late at night. You could check your watch using him. He went to the plant, holding a heavy cane under his arm, politely lifted his hat, bowing to local citizens. The first American tool Ihor Sikorsky held in his hands were scissors for cutting metal. He managed to make them out of a bumper he had bought at a dump. This rubbish dump eventually became the main source of materials for the company, especially prized beams and corners of old beds. With their help, any parts of aircraft were well secured. There was never enough money. Even the impressive sum of $5,000, about $80,000 today, donated by the outstanding composer Sergei Rachmaninov were not enough to rescue it. Dear Ihor Ivanovich, I was told yesterday that you are building a machine that rises and falls vertically. Is this true? Would you be so kind as to answer me, at least in one word? Then my heart will be filled with pride and joy. But to begin the production of helicopters Sikorsky could not manage. The drawing still seemed incomplete. He was so very short of time. Leonardo, did my fate to prepare the same fate to desperately dream of a helicopter and to be content merely with drawings? Testing the designer's new S-29-8 was also on the agenda, but the test failed. The plane fell to the ground like a stone. Fortunately, no one was seriously hurt, but when the plane took off, the orders appeared. For example, transporting a piano for Mrs. Hoover, the spouse of the President of the United States, and delivering alcohol, which was prohibited at that time. The designer earned some money. He was able to marry Elizabeth, with whom he had become acquainted during his time as a teacher. Sikorsky's sister also went to America, and not by herself, but with her son and his daughter from his first marriage. The aircraft builder quickly understood what to do with his nephew. Once a reporter from a New York newspaper decided to film the city from a height lying on the wing of an airplane. Tying the reporter tightly, Ihor stuck his nephew on the other wing, for the sake of balance. The plane served its creator a couple of years until it was sold to entrepreneur Howard Hughes. He effectively blew up the S-29A in his film Hell's Angels. Seventy-five victories in the battles of the World War I were recorded at his own expense by French hero and number one Allied fighter ace pilot René Fonck. But the pilot wasn't getting ready to quit his profession after the war. He decided to win the prize of millionaire Raymond Ortigue. $25,000 to whoever could fly non-stop from New York to Paris. This particular client came to Sikorsky with an ambitious proposal. Iher devoted all his time to this project. The client was quite a difficult one. He was in a constant hurry because he wanted to fly in the autumn. I insisted on full testing and suggested that the flight be postponed. Fong didn't agree. The flight was scheduled for September 20th, 1926. Spectators began to arrive at the airport before dawn. A co-pilot, radio operator and a mechanic all flew with Fong. The team took their places and the engines roared. The plane gained speed. Suddenly, the speed drops, dust, the wheels of the chassis fly off and the tailgate breaks off. The giant machine falls into a ravine from a height of 6 meters and immediately bursts into flames. Fong and the co-pilot had time to get out, but the mechanic and the radio operator died. Six months later, Sikorsky was still in a dead trap because of an uninsured aircraft and loss of faith. In 
In May 1927, a little-known young pilot called Charles Lindbergh made the first transatlantic flight in history on a battered plane with one engine. The event was inspiring. Sikorsky borrowed money and moved the plant closer to the water. The designers strove to create an ambitious aircraft, different capacity and which would be able to fly long distance. The first amphibian was ready in 1927. The official customer was Pan American, the largest U.S. aviation company. Charles Lindbergh, technical advisor to the airline, came to receive the order. He approved the amphibian. The two like-minded thinkers became friends. Sikorsky hydroplanes enjoyed great popularity over the next 10 years, giving the creator fame and fortune. The amphibious aircraft flew in the Caribbean, was used in Africa, and earned a reputation as being the safest and most comfortable transport in the world. Sikorsky's name is known around the world. He made a fortune. The designer loved children and spent all his free time with them. His daughter Tatiana had given him a grandson recently. But Sikorsky's childhood dream remains with him. The helicopter, which his idol Leonardo da Vinci dreamt of, had not been created yet. The helicopter, more than any other transport, brings us closer to the tale of the humpbacked horse and the flying carpet. Two years later, Adolf Hitler felt that the German Air Force had gained enough power. The Luftwaffe had a total of 1,888 aircraft of various types and about 20,000 personnel. Reports about the potential of German aviation caused panic outside the Third Reich. On October 12, 1938, the Congress of the Lilienthal Society for the Study of the Science of Aeronautics was held in Berlin. Many foreign aviation specialists, pilots and designers from abroad were present. The British Air and Water Society was represented by Charles Lindbergh and the USA by the great aircraft design engineer Igor Sikorsky. He immediately rushed to the workshop designer Fokke. He achieved great success in helicopter building. In Germany, the scientists made sure that the helicopter should be built with a single rotor scheme. Many didn't believe in this venture. But most importantly, the US Congress believed in it. The authorities allocated Sikorsky $3 million to create a serial helicopter. It was presented in May 1940. The plane flew right, left, back and even turned around. But in no way did it want to fly forward. However, the designer was happy. It was already a victory. Two years later, as per a contract placed by the US Army, the world's first ever serial helicopter, the Sikorsky R-4, was released. It was used at the end of the World War II, mostly during rescue operations. If you are in trouble and in an accessible place, the plane can throw flowers to you and the helicopter will hang in the air and save you. After World War II, a real helicopter boom began in the United States. More than 340 firms were organized, and they all took up development of helicopters. However, Sikorsky's firm won the competition and became a recognized leader in the global market. The list of engineering victories by Sikorsky. The world's first passenger plane and a heavy bomber, a seaplane, a two-story helicopter, an amphibious helicopter, a flying crane, a rubberized fabric helicopter. Checkmate. My friend and idol Leonardo and I won a game of chess that lasted for years. I created a helicopter in the way that my mind saw it, although you, the restless Italian, were the inspiration. During his life, Igor Sikorsky developed 17 basic models of aircraft and 18 helicopters. Today, the Queen of Great Britain, Elizabeth II, prefers the Sikorsky brand. Helicopters are in the service of the U.S. Air Force and the security services of the American presidents. 99% of the helicopters around the world are made according to the designer's design plan. Sikorsky retired. He sailed, played the piano, spent more time with his children and grandchildren. The inventor died in 1972. Kyiv Airport, 
Almost 3 million passengers fly from here to different parts of the world every year. Since 2018, this airport has borne the name of Igor Sikorsky, the outstanding Ukrainian designer.